One week before my first aerobatic contest and after months of practice, I got a text telling me my prop was broken in the hangar and I just kind of wanted to crawl into a hole. Honestly, it was so disappointing and frustrating, all the emotions all at once, but the community came together and I got a backup airplane to fly here. So I will be flying an RV-8 for the competition this weekend. It's the Canadian National Aerobatic Championships and the advanced team is here training and competing. A recent episode covers a debrief with team member Ryan. He was hoping to be flying his Sukhoi 26, but due to a pretty serious accident, he's also had to pivot. So it turned out we're both in kind of a similar situation, both flying backup airplanes Yep. due to prop strikes. Exactly. Yours is a lot worse than mine. Yes, definitely. But the funny thing is the result fundamentally is the same. I had to fully ground my airplane, potentially looking at an engine teardown even for a tiny prop strike. Yeah. In the certified world, I don't remember how the language exactly is written, but if a prop requires repair, period, it's like engine teardown. Yeah. And that can cost over $30,000, so I've got some hard decisions to make, but in the meantime, I'm going to make some lemonade out of these lemons in the RV-8. So this is most of Team Canada's airplanes packed very tightly in this hangar on a rainy day during training week. And when you do it right, you can literally overlap airplanes. That's what they've done here. You got props overlapping stabilizers. You got to orient the prop a certain way to make it all work and you're careful. It's great. We had a situation at the museum, unfortunately, where I got a hangar rash from the trailing edge of the Harvard aileron being pushed into the trailing edge of my prop blade. So that grounded the airplane. That was that. So that's why it's not here. This episode covers the aftermath of what happened to the RV-14. The Harvard is okay, by the way. And how the community came together to help me pivot to a new aircraft to fly in my first aerobatic competition. I'm not gonna lie, I felt a great deal of pressure at this event and to stay present as a pilot and maintain my focus. Sportsman is the, is the last one. Brock was here to take care of the filming. Uh, all joking aside, you really do need to present the geometry of these maneuvers in the right spot for the audience. The past few months I've been working hard capturing content leading up to this event and training for it. And I'm very thankful to Adam and his family for helping with this last minute pivot. So I'm definitely a bit of an underdog here, uh, but I'm happy to do it and share the process of the challenges. I'm gonna be flying Adam's airplane and he's just been pounding on it. And it's really cool to see how proficient he's gotten in such a short amount of time. I think he's got less than 20 hours in the airplane. And I watched him fly the sportsman from the ground and it looked like he did a pretty good job. Hey, you held it that time. You held the line beautifully. Very, very nice. It's gonna be a tough battle between him and I, and uh, I'll be happy to see him beat me, honestly. So I'm just happy to be here flying, and we'll see how it goes. If Steve does his job well, and he just stays in the game, he's focused, he's not overthinking too much, I think it'll be a, it'll be a close battle. I'm personally, you know, other than my own uh, competition in advance, Sportsman is what I'm going to be watching for the most. I, I'm really excited to see how it plays out. That's Luke Penner. He's Adam's instructor and my aerobatic mentor. He's also team captain for the Canadian Advanced Aerobatic Team. And we did a lot of training leading up to this contest, including Luke and I working with Aaron, the team's coach, at his base in Iowa. It was a huge setback to be facing a potential engine teardown in the RV-14, but team member Ryan has some recent experience with prop strikes, so he gave me some great insights. With the Sukhoi accident, obviously the prop was damaged beyond repair. So uh, in that case, because the, the prop strike was significant, we had to basically tear the motor down, right? Um, it's the right thing to do. It's a lot of impact. Um, however, like with this aircraft, we had an aircraft bump into the trailing edge of the propeller, which, which actually caused a bit of damage after consulting a lot of experts and the mechanics um, because the prop propeller is not moving and these props are so fragile there's basically very minimal load on the crank. Uh, so what I decided to do with this aircraft was not have it inspected uh, based on expert opinions and knowing the fact that you know these prop propellers are extremely delicate. So I'm literally in the same boat on that as far as a trailing edge damage that we're pretty well we know from the engineering report from Hartzell that no damage made it to the hub. Yep. We also did the crank flange runout test. We were within like 0.5 of a thousandth of an inch. That was within tolerance. So the decision I'm making ultimately is not to do the teardown. So you had the right to make that decision. When, yep. But if it was certified, you wouldn't have had that. That would be no, no conversation. Yeah, exactly. If it's certified because of just so many more regulations and conditions, because in order to maintain that certification standard, they have to hold it to a much higher standard, which makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Uh, but these are high performance aerobatic uh, experimental aircraft. So we have a lot more flexibility in terms of what we decide to do or not do in our aircraft. So it's kind of a double edged sword because we're both in the world of experimental that we have the power to exercise I mean I guess I want to say common sense yeah. but you also got to realize you are taking that on yeah absolutely the experiment especially in the aerobatic world like we fly these aircraft pretty hard so safety for us is absolutely paramount like we're extremely sensitive 
and d dialed into our aircraft. So we, we notice every little change. We're flying pretty low to the ground. We're doing a lot of advanced aerobatics. And I want to go home and see my family at the end of the day. This is not a, you know, we know what the risks are. We want to mitigate that as much as we can. So, but sometimes you got to exercise common sense. You know, like I said, these propellers are extremely delicate. You could break it in your hand. So we're going to try that? You we're going to try that with one of my old props. We'll, we'll, basically, it's an MT wood composite propeller, but they're extremely fragile, especially on the trailing edge of the prop, which I think is where you had your yep. strike as well. So it was amazing to hear you'd had a similar experience. Almost identical. A tip tank of a 310 went right into the back of the prop Correct. and split it, and I think it's actually worse than yours. I could have cowboyed it and hung the new prop because Hartzell did get it repaired pretty quickly for me, but I just decided I'm not going to, like, go launch on a big cross country with a yeah. one hour test flight at home. So I am going to put it into a test program to revalidate it and then bring it back online without doing a full engine teardown. That's exactly what I did. I pretty much stayed at home base, stayed right above the airport and did a bunch of tests until I had confidence that everything was fine. And yeah. it's got, I'd say 60 hours on it now and I fly pretty hard. So no signs of damage or any tear. Right. Uh, so it's doing great. So that's ultimately what I decided. I just didn't want to put the engine back into an infant mortality risk state and having to break it in again sucks. But regardless, I wasn't going to launch for this almost a thousand mile trip. Cross country is the most dangerous part of it. These aircraft are extremely limited. Don't have a lot of avionics. We actually have a pilot departed here that was stranded on his way home because of wildfire smoke and had to take an airline ride the rest of the way. You know, 53 years of the International Aerobatic Club in North America, never an incident in a contest. No life lost, no critical damage to an airplane. But there's been many instances of aircraft being lost or pilots or people getting hurt trying to get to and from a contest. That is always the dangerous part, every time. You can see this airplane uh, is not built with creature comforts in mind. You know, there's no autopilot. I have hardly any instruments. There's no gyros of, of any sort. Just have a basic Garmin GPS. And the rest of it is just flight controls. We run with bare minimum VFR stuff. It's way more dangerous flying to and from the contest, way more. Like that's the most stressful part of doing a contest, is cross country there. We'll meet the team and their airplanes in more detail in an upcoming episode. But for this one, I was fascinated with how they ferry these purpose-built machines and wanted to share some of the insights they offered about their panels. So this is my sequence card holder that holds the sequence that I'm gonna be flying for whatever competition or aerobatic flight I'm doing that day. Inside here I got altimeter and airspeed. Here's a secondary digital altimeter I use for AGL, so I know my height above the ground. It's a quick, just easy glance. All my engine instruments are here, and then uh, radio, transponder, basic stuff. All right, what am I looking at? All right, so very limited in terms of panel. And here, this is uh, my partner's sequence card, so there's nothing behind that except for uh, just a ball. Uh, your basic engine gauges, altimeter, airspeed indicator, 2G meters, and you've got your fuel controls here, uh, the transponder, radio, and then I also have, a, I usually fly with an iPad, which has just an EFIS on it, just for backup, if I had to do some sort of cloud break, in a, you know, if I'm in a tight, tight bind, but it's also what I use for primary navigation, and I also have a backup device as well. Very basic, uh, just uh, very minimum. The airplane is, as you can see, built very strong. What is not needed is not in it. Clock, which is also my fuel gauge. Yes, a couple timers there, and that's my fuel management. My only fuel gauge is the last 10 liters here in this clear tube. So if you start seeing anything on the gauge, it's time to land now. So my main fuel management is by the stopwatch. And yeah, a couple of engine gauges, and that's basically it. The most stressful part about this sport is getting to the competitions. It's not being out there being judged, it's getting there. I kid you not, you know, especially in these very limited Super VFR setups, you know, flying hundreds of miles, sometimes thousands. Um, that's the part that stresses me out the most. So having some tech on board brings that down. Luke is flying the primary sequence in the Nanchang this year because he never got the patch for that category. And it's not hyperbolic to say that ferrying this airplane would be very challenging. The panel is literally in Chinese. Probably the biggest transition to jumping into this airplane from the RV-14 is how different the avionics are. It is not hard for me to get behind Sirius XM products for this type of situation. It's an unfamiliar aircraft to me. If I had to ferry this thing somewhere, even with that panel, I would absolutely be flying with Four Flight and a GDL-52 to give me the kind of data that I'm used to having in the RV-14 because I have a built-in receiver. I lent Luke my GDL-52 for this season and it's been a game changer for him. 
I'm definitely proud to be working with SiriusXM Aviation, and currently there's a really good rebate running if you want to check it out. So if I'm on cross country and I'm approaching an airport that I need to divert to or something, I can check the winds. Maybe there's a crosswind that's outside my limits and I don't want to choose that as my location to go to, and I can get that data outside of range to pick up the ATIS on the radio. And of course, other things like storms, you got your radar. It's not real time, but it's very close to real time, so you can get a pretty good picture of trending, if things are building, fronts are moving. None of that you can do without having onboard weather data. I don't know how they used to do it. I know Jersey didn't think he needed it. He, I mean, he's been doing it for years without it. Oh, pff, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, people were flying for 100 years with a stopwatch and a finger and a chart, yeah? So it's nice to have all this electronic, you know, modern goodies, but you can fly it just fine without it. <laughs> Jersey pretty much was like, I don't need it. <laughs> but, Sounds like Jersey. But I mean, he takes that thing fair distances, and I was looking at the panel in that. Yeah, he flew almost 800 nautical miles here. So would you want to ferry that Sukhoi without it? No, I really would not. I would want an iPad, I'd want some weather hookup, so... Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, especially in Canada, like, when we have, we have less diversion airports than yeah. they do down south. You know, larger gaps between airports, so having that situational awareness, knowing ahead what's going on yeah. in one of these more limited airplanes is, is hugely beneficial. Conditions were challenging for the days leading up to the contest, but I did get a solid practice flight in with Coach Aaron working from the ground to help me dial things in. Steinbeck North Traffic, Tango November Bravo, back taxi 33, immediate departure to loiter for the box, Steinbeck North. And here's a sneak peek at one of my judging cards. The way it works is three judges score each flight, and the work that we got done on this flight really helped yield some solid results. And quick disclaimer, you see some yellow on the panel there. That's just due to calibration of their EFIS and also the EGT for cylinder one. The probe isn't working. Back north traffic, uh, yellow, or correction, it's the uh, RVA climb in for the box. Am I good to switch to box frequency over? Hey Steve, yeah, you can switch over. Aaron's just taking a little break, he'll be here in 30 seconds. Roger, switching over. Alright, Steve, Aaron's back with you. I'll be ready when you are. Gotcha, just 500 to go for the climb, and I'll be on base in a second. Okay, I'm getting the microphones ready. Good if I listen in on this one? Please do! This is sportsman, so there might be a few things in here that apply to apply to. have a seat. Oh, no, no. No, no, no. You, 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 should, you really should sit at one of these seats and watch from this perspective. Yeah, you really good. should. Yeah. You can see your plane flying the yeah. sequence. Yeah. Also, this will give you an idea, of, yes, exactly, what your airplane looks like. Great point, Neil. Yeah, just trying to reposition my, my uh, the best strategy here. So I want to be almost at the edge of the box on base and dive right in, aim it towards center. Correct. Just outside of center and drop in from there. That would work. So this is my first time flying in a well-marked box. You can barely see those markers with the GoPros, but the naked eye could see them really well, even at altitude, which was pretty cool. Apparently these corner ones are quite easy to set up, but this center marker out in the middle of a cornfield, that was a bit of an adventure for a team of volunteers to get done. Brock borrowed a big pair of boots and joined the team to film it. Which direction are we doing first? Following the runway, so 3-3. Three, three. <laughs> Have fun getting video in here. Great. No flights are conducted while the markers are being set up, other than a drone that's helping with placement. A little bit to the right. It's top. Okay, like two steps towards the north. Everyone, two steps towards the north. Looking good. There we go. Yep. Uh, half a step more. All right, how is it looking now we did that? It looks good on the drone. Abram, how is this looking? You can just stretch it out more so I can see it better. A lot goes into making these contests happen, and again, there will be a dedicated episode about the event. But for now, let's get back on board for the coaching flight. Okay, got you in sight. 
Steve, Aaron with you on the 17th of August. It is your first flight in the box in a borrowed airplane. It's always a fun time. I know it's deeper, it's way back in the box, but we'll see the geometry. Okay, got two wing wags, that's good. Now, from this position, now I can see everything. I can see the maneuver. You can show the maneuver to the judges. This is where you want to be. Perfect spot. Go. Dead center of the box. All right. All right, there we go. That's a very nice loop, sir. Very nice. Go. A little shallow. You need to steepen that up a little bit on the next pass, okay? And you're towards the wheels. Pull back a little more. It'll help the hammerhead. There you go. There you go. And get the speed you need. Use it to set up for this wedge. Okay. And when you're ready, go. Come towards the wheels. Pull back a little more. Now come over. Now, look where you're at. Look for heading. Look for the markers. There you go. Good. Great. Nice figure. Tighten that up from the last pass. That's good. Okay. Go. And remember to unload the wing. Unload and then pure aileron. No rudder. Whoop. A little too early on the roll. That's why you got off heading. Let's just break. Let's just pick up and do just the ammo then. Focus on just the half loop up, okay? Roger. It is a different airplane. It responds, it rolls faster than the 14. It unloads the wing differently. It picks up speed differently. So there are some differences that you got to learn here. If you're interested in seeing this entire raw flight, it's currently available for Patreon supporters. And a huge thanks to everyone that's over there for being a core part of the community. Cool, yeah, I just gotta get that Emelman. Yep, so the only thing we need to get is the Emelman. And that's just, again, it's a different airplane, it's a different dynamic. You had the essence of it there. Come back in, let's do the Emelman one or two times. That's all we need to do, okay? Well, let's not over taxi on this. Roger. And he'll still get an official contest practice tomorrow, as will you, so, yeah. you know. Well, it depends on the wind. wind is, is, this supposed, is this supposed to get gusty tomorrow? Yeah, apparently. I haven't looked ahead. According to Taff, it's unlikely that we'll be able to go. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Man, just toppled the gyro on the dyno in there. Oh, did you? Pardon? He says it tumbled the gyro on the dyno. Yeah, I can do that sometimes. Yep, yep. Yeah. Did we just shoot a commercial for Garmin? May have. <laughs> I had to throw that out there. I had to. I have Dynon Ephus in my glass here. My dad has Garmin stack in his aircraft. And there are differences. Not bad. I love my Dynon, but both companies are innovating a lot of cool stuff. I love the RV-14, but I gotta admit the roll rate was just so much easier to achieve and much less effort required in the RV-8. That combination worked. Nice job, Steve. Thank you. Uh, you've been up there hammering at this thing for quite a bit, almost 16 minutes. I think we should call her a break, 22-7, come on down, okay? Down, thanks. All right, nice work. Thank you, appreciate the help. With Steve still up in the air and uh, he's nowhere near, give me uh, the straight skinny on um, how he's doing. So, uh, what you think? <laughs> so for having, I, I know, insider information. Yeah, yeah this is his, comp his competitor. I know. Um, so honestly, for switching airplanes, he's doing remarkably well because I know they're both Vans aircraft, but from going for the 14 and what we trained in Iowa to the RV-8, which we're training here, it is a drastically different thing. I mean, the 14, you fly left-handed. This one, you fly right-handed. That alone is a big factor. Secondly, the seating position, he's not offset left, he's center line. So the feel on everything is different. So I'm really proud of how he's adapting. So yeah, I gotta, I gotta hand it to him. Is it perfect? No, but that was a huge stride in one flight. That was great. So very happy. I definitely see why you want me like far to the back he, exactly because it was way easier to see even when he was just like a little farther that way it yep. was like uh, a fundamental difference between this airplane and my airplane is that he's got it set up for pretty legit negative g uh, he's got flop tubes in the in the right tank so that's his inverted acrobatic tank and he's got uh, inverted full inverted oil system 
and he's got ratchet belts. So that lets you really reef yourself in. So it's two separate lap belts. I think of Vans aircraft as multi-purpose airplanes, unlike Luke's. This is a single seat extra 330SC, German built airplane, purpose built for competition aerobatics. In fact, that's what the C and SC stands for, it's competition. This airplane only has one purpose to exist and that is to fly high performance, high level aerobatics. So this is a hooker harness ratchet seatbelt system and then it has dual ratchets. This is pretty common uh, on aerobatic airplanes of this level. Because when we're pushing, you can see from my last flight here, this is a G meter. So this one pegs out maximum of negative five. So I went past that. Um, and then on the positive scale, just over nine positive Gs. So when I'm pushing all those negative Gs, this whole belt apparatus, the metal components, the gears, can press hard into my, you know, into my body. So I have these gels in here just to really uh, give me a bit more comfort. In addition to that, I have these uh, yoga pads that I stick here uh, just to give me a little more comfort because it does hurt quite a lot if you don't have this so it's a lot of hardware to live with in the airplane and I made the decision I didn't want them it's how much am I really gonna do hard negative G I'm gonna fly the airplane IFR cross-country with passengers a lot more often and that's a lot of hardware to always be permanently attached to the airplane beside your hip so I made the calculated decision to not have ratchet belts which therefore meant I'm not gonna be doing sustained negative G um, but I do want the inverted oil system, or the half raven at least, so I can do some of these types of figures where I'm zero, negative half, briefly. My belts will do a good enough job just tightening them up. And if we look at the G meter after Adam flies, we'll see that he typically pulls a whole negative G. The same airplane, same sequence. I'm hanging in there around zero. So we can compare our G meters. I'm actually pulling a little harder than he is. The joke is apparently when you do competition, you pull a G harder than you do at home. Because I typically fly the sequence at four and a half, and I'm seeing consistently five and a half when I come back from flying it in this thing. But I'm still not going more than zero negative. So check this out on landing. This airport is right beside a golf course, and watch that golf cart. These guys could not have gotten any closer to the runway, and they kept on driving toward it. My entire time on short final, I was very close to going around. I'm curious if you guys would have gone around or continued this landing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this one. Lots of great content coming. And again, thanks to Adam and his family. He's sharing some pretty cool content over on his channel called Turned and Banked. I'll also be making a dedicated episode about him because we got some really great stuff covering him flying this contest. He'd actually already flown previously in the primary category last year. So until next time, keep your flight chops sharp.